everybody loves a forest, right? These days, as climate change accelerates and worsens, and we scramble to find solutions for our survival and collective well-being, you'll often hear forests hailed as these great heroes of climate change for the way that they sequester carbon and emit oxygen, the way that they cycle water, making that moisture available to living things, and create these hot spots of biodiversity upon which our entire web of life relies. And as we go forward, facing the challenges of the present and the future, a lot of cities and towns and communities are looking to build up our climate resilience and take those ecological benefits of intact ecosystems, somehow reinstate them. Unfortunately, our built environments haven't always prioritized nature. Our soils, our waterways, our forests and other ecosystems, we haven't been kind to them. But luckily, new and innovative methods are taking root to reintegrate and reestablish nature in the places where people live. The Miyawaki method is one such approach to creating small, dense, biodiverse native pocket forests. It was pioneered originally by Dr. Akira Miyawaki, a Japanese botanist and ecologist who through decades of work, of observation, and of professorship, developed a method for replanting forests using his understanding of the native vegetation that was appropriate to an area, and what was needed to sort of facilitate that ecosystem coming back into a place where the conditions had been degraded. Starting with a healthy living forest floor and selecting the vegetation that could grow at each vertical layer to create a dense canopy and a full microclimate, Dr. Miyawaki built up what is essential to a functioning forest which is the complexity, the biodiversity, and the symbiosis that makes an ecosystem much more than just the sum of its parts. The Miyawaki Forest, based on this method of dense plantation, native species, biodiversity, can grow really quickly, survive at high rates, and reestablish under the stressful conditions that a lot of our urban and suburban areas have. And crucially, they can be done in quite small areas, around 1,000 square feet at minimum, or six parking spaces. That's not much bigger than the stage I'm standing on today. In these areas, you can create pockets of life rather than the corner of a parking lot or a schoolyard or the lawn in front of City Hall or an abandoned lot. In these places bereft of life and growing things, we can start to create mini forests that are buzzing, alive, thriving, and providing ecological benefits to all of their inhabitants, human and non-human alike. These pocket forests can, of course, do what trees do best that we love them for, sequestering carbon and emitting oxygen. But the dense canopy also filters air pollution and creates a haven against noise pollution as well, a respite in a city that's otherwise lacking. They improve the soils when that dense network of roots and of other living things underground starts to take a hold. It makes soil more porous. This gives water a place to go, which is essential as we face these intense storm events. And when water just builds up, it starts to flood. And when we don't hold it in the ground, we start to become more susceptible to drought. And so as we, pocket by pocket, start to address this, we can establish that natural infrastructure in the places where we need them. These are also living laboratories. They're places where people can come, can learn about the native ecosystems, can learn about food and medicine trees, and what native species look like. In about three years, they become fully self-sustaining. But before that time, it takes a little bit of stewardship to get it going. People come by to water and maintain, and in doing so, they have a participatory role in our ecosystems. We get to start to play the role of facilitator, not just destroyer, not just consumer, not just taker, but grower and restorer. Now going to the question of resilience, I want to show you how a little bit of nature goes a long way. This is a photograph from the city of Melbourne, where on a hot summer day, the temperature differential between a shaded and vegetated area, an open pavement 
just yards away, just re-radiating its heat. It's about 30 degrees Celsius, or about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty stark. If it's a hot summer day and you have the choice between 94 degrees Celsius and 141, the choice is pretty obvious. And setting aside any future projections of temperature rise, adverse health outcomes from heat, extreme stress, and deaths are already being caused. If we look to the future and think about how we're going to survive rising temperatures, we can't just rely on acute interventions like air conditioning or other energy intensive methods. When we look to reintegrate nature pocket by pocket back into our cities, we can start to take the steps that make us truly more resilient in a self-sustaining way. Now, this is a picture of New York City, where I grew up. And New York, like Boston, like many other cities around the country and around the globe, often sees its environmental harms concentrated in the most marginalized communities, in communities of color and low-income communities. And if you're familiar with the city, you can see that in this photo here. But you can also see on this map one of the solutions. Where there's parks and green spaces, you see lowered temperatures. The urban heat island effect is actually broken up by these spaces of vegetation, because as trees evapotranspirate and cycle water, they also cool off the areas around them. And while we may not be able to create another central park in one of these pockets of red, we can start little by little to tile in pocket forests, creating a mosaic of biodiversity and of life. And further than that, it's a lot of fun to participate in. You know, when I was growing up in New York, I genuinely thought that ecosystems were elsewhere, that you went outside of the city to go see nature. There were parks, yes, but there weren't wild spaces. There wasn't much biodiversity. But as we plant these forests, we can go from areas with one or two fledgling saplings to something that just a year later is bursting with life, these emerald treasures where the air is alive, where you can hear and smell and see the difference, where the tallest trees have now outgrown humans, where biodiversity starts to come back in droves. First, you start with the smaller insects. Then you see the bigger ones that come and eat them, the dragonflies, the butterflies, the bees. You can see the earthworms that partner with microbes to create this healthy, living soil. You can see fungi these heroes of decomposition and of creating networks underground for trees to trade resources. You can see this variety of life. And you can also see the difference that one makes when actually taking part in our ecosystems and changing them for the better. In a matter of just a few years, we go from nothing to small trees to a living, buzzing, growing forest. And because of the diversity, because of the planting method and the density, these forests are resilient to the threats that are ongoing and accelerating, to drought, to disease, to pests. When you plant an ecosystem, you get to have something that self-sustains rather than a standalone tree or just one type of tree. These communicate, they support each other, like the best communities, they're more than the sum of their parts. And as we grow these, we can also realize the fundamental issue of climate change is not something we can or have to solve alone. We are in partnership with all of these other living beings. We are doing our part, and so too are these trees, these microbes, these fungi, these insects. We can grow elderberries full of antioxidants, we can start to learn about our native species, learn about food that has fallen out of use, learn about what has been used traditionally, and start to re-empower ourselves to embrace that once again and to live a little bit closer to this living, breathing earth once again. And that regeneration is much more than ecological. In a time where our crises just build upon one another, it's easy to believe that the only things that we can do is sit by and watch, or to try our very best to do just a little bit less damage, a little bit less emission, a little bit less pollution. 
But when you grow a tree, see it grow tall, see it change color in the fall, see the way that they bloom, the way that they bear fruit, you get to take part in not just degradation, but going the opposite direction. You get to regenerate. And you get to be part of a growing community of people all around the world who are doing the same. Miyawaki forests are taking off around the globe. They started in Japan with Dr. Miyawaki, but a recent wave has brought them throughout India, through the Middle East, in Jordan, in Lebanon. In the Netherlands, they're doing a whole wave of tiny forests associated with schools so that kids planting one year, as they go through their education, can tend these and see years later how they've doubled, tripled, quadrupled in size. They've come here in Cambridge, where we planted our last forest last week, all the way out to Berkeley, California, to the Yakima Nation out west, uh, to a county courthouse in Chicago. And they're showing people, especially young people, what they can do to make a difference immediately. Rather than waiting for our climate to change as we reduce emissions, we can start little by little to make these interventions for our own resilience. We can get out there with our families, our friends, our classmates, our neighbors. We can get planting. And we can start to put living creatures in the ground that will go on for decades to come, that will outlive us and become the ancestors of the generations ahead of us. They say that the best time to plant a tree is 40 years ago. And now I'll tell you the second best time is today. And this goes double for forests. When we create these ecosystems, when we learn to live in community with other living things, when we plant and regenerate and increase our resilience, we are increasing the resilience of the whole. And we are making ourselves just that much closer to a healthy, livable, flourishing planet. So let's get planting. Thank you. <laughs>